I am thrilled to welcome back Amanda Gibby Peters, a Rebel 11 favorite and one of my favorites, I have to say. I am fascinated by feng shui and have been since I learned about the Bakwa in my early 20s. Could a water leak mean a money leak? What if you swept your doormat regularly or underneath your doormat? What if putting a $20 bill or whatever you could afford in your wealth house? What about that? As Amanda says, feng shui is a transformative practice that recognizes the interconnectedness between our environment and our personal empowerment. And what if everything around you is an invitation to guide the energy and your life toward what you want? That is feng shui's superpower. Woohoo, I can't wait to talk more. Amanda is the voice and founder of Simple Shui, a modern day mission driven, love based practice of feng shui, and the host of the House Therapy podcast. She's been teaching feng shui techniques for nearly two decades and also wrote this amazing, amazing book, Simple Shui for Every Day. 365 ways to feng shui your life. Mine is very well used and I love this book. Welcome, Amanda. I can't wait to dive in. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to be back and to have another conversation about feng shui. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much. So, you know, as I mentioned, I, you know, I was fascinated by at the moment that I heard about the bakwa. Tell us about how you got interested, what was that nexus point where it, it changed your world? So this is always a fun story. And, um, you know, if people have been following me at all, they have heard it, but it's still so fascinating. So I came to Feng Shui absolutely as a skeptic. We had moved into a new to us house in a new to us town. And a lot of things in our lives were starting to bear the marks of a lot of stress. And on a particularly bad day, I grabbed a book. I was like, whatever I read is going to be my answer. I read feng shui and it has something to do with change your house, change your life. And I thought this is so nuts. And I was woo -woo you know, and of, crazy out there. <laughs> yeah. Like what I, you know, and, and as naive as I was, you know, I thought, you know, well, I just moved houses. So what does this know? But there was something in me that felt more alive in that response than I had with everything that was going on. And so I thought, well, I'll just prove that this doesn't work because at the time the logs were just taking off. And so I thought this is perfect. You know, I just finished a master's program in communication. So I was like, I'll marry these two things. Right. And I'll be an overnight success. And really what happened was, you know, there weren't big changes initially, but I kept getting more curious, like something kept prompting me to do something else. Right. And so I was stepping into what I now see as the conversation with our house and our house was starting to feel more like home. And about three or four months in, there had been enough coincidences that I really had this moment of truth with myself. Is this all just coincidence and, you know, just dumb luck or is there something happening here. And if I'm curious about what's happening, I need to you know, stop being so skeptical and become the student. And that's what started this entire journey for me. So, so tell us about some of those coincidences. Well, so when we moved here, um, immediately it seemed like all of our, um, finances, like everything that we money related was stressed. Um, I had three-year-old twins at the time. They are turning 21 today. <laughs> oh, happy birthday, twins. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. But they were three at the time. And, you know, they had been in a really great, like, sort of preschool program where we'd moved from. But when we moved here, there weren't any openings. Everyone had a wait list. And so, you know, my husband was traveling. We were stressed about money. The kids were home and three is such a fun age. Um, and you know, it was just little things on top of that. And it just felt like everything was fraying. And within a couple months, my husband got a job offer out of the blue and his salary more than doubled. And the preschool that was at the top of our list called and said, Hey, we have two openings in the same class, same day, same time. Do you want them? 
And I was like, full stop. Um, but even that, I'll be honest, I was like, okay, coincidences. So whenever my clients, you know, especially the ones who like, maybe it's a partnership and one of the partners doesn't want me in the house. They're like, yeah, coincidences. I'm like, I've been you, I know you, <laughs> <laughs> I did one more thing. And that was okay. Money sort of addressed, like got kids and school. So now I want to go start this career that I just spent all of this money on, you know, getting my um, graduate degree. And so I sent out three letters because this was pre-email being our primary mode of communication. Mm -hmm. I sent out three cold letters to three companies I'd love to work for. And, you know, again, the short version of this is I got invited to interview at all three places and was offered a job at all three places. I had written out exactly what I wanted before I sent any of those letters out. So the one that offered me exactly what I wanted was the one that I took, even though it wasn't what I call the most glam job. Like the other ones had a lot of perks that I was like, oh, that would be great. But I needed the flexibility to be home. And shortly after that, you know, the economy crashed and people were being let go. And my job was actually able to keep me on. And so that moment that I'm like, okay, something's going on because this is too many coincidences in a row to just think that I'm this lucky when previously I'd had no luck, it seemed like. <laughs> and can you talk to us about being super clear about desires and, and how that works with feng shui? Yeah. So, you know, I know a lot of people talk about getting into the details and the feeling state and holding that emotional space. And I think all of those are important parts of that process, you know, that creating or, you know, um, stating intentions. But what I think is really important is having that feeling state so that you're in the positive space of it, but remaining super neutral about how it has to play out. So like my story is actually a really great example of that, which is, you know, I could have totally said, well, these other two jobs, you know, one's with a PR company, one's working with a lot of great famous people. That would be fun. This other one is, you know, in politics. And this one was a little more law, you know, but it had everything that I'd asked. And because I, you know, sort of honored that, like, this was what I asked. This is what showed up. So I'm going to trust this. Not only was I able to stay employed during a period that a lot of people were fraught with trying to find another job, mm -hmm. but it also gave me the wiggle room to start getting into feng shui and studying because it wasn't as demanding of a job. And so I think that's the part of the intention process is you can't white knuckle and you got to have a lot mm -hmm. of like faith and sort of trust that the next right action is going to make itself known. So tell us some of the other things that you did in the house that started to change your perspective, that this was something that wasn't woo woo, that it was actually working. Like, give us like one of the things that, you know, you have, you know, I watch your Instagram all the time. It's like, maybe just start with your doormat. Like what, tell us about that. Yeah. So there were a couple things that, you know, so what's interesting is your house, I'll say to everyone, your house is already talking to you. Just most of us aren't primed to understand that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that I noticed right when I moved in pre feng shui was thing was this horrible builder's beige and it just, it, it flatlined everything. And I was so bothered by it, but because I had no language for it, I thought I was just getting hung up on something that felt frivolous, right? It's just paint. Like it doesn't matter. It's not like we're healthy. You know, we've got food in the fridge, like all the things that we run through, but I didn't realize how the space you're in, you're under its influence all the time. Mm -hmm. So slowly my energy was being siphoned. It was like drying me out. It was parching all of the creativity in that. Um, so one of the things that I insisted on doing shortly after coming into feng shui was just painting it, right? Like I started to make this connection that, you know, you want your space to feel inviting. And I was like, well, the color will make such a difference. Mm -hmm. Now I can look back on that and put a lot of context around it. Now that was all earth. It was very like, it just absorbed anything that came its way. There wasn't anything bouncing color or light anywhere. And we'd actually gone for a much lighter color. So that was one of the bigger changes that we made, not initially, but mm -hmm. within that first year. Another thing that I remember trying to figure out was like this 
thing called command position where you sit sort of like an executive would in, in their office, right? Where their back is to a wall and they can see anyone coming in. Now I share my space. You can see the chair over there. I share my space with my husband. So at the time trying to figure out how to create this command for two people, it seems so obvious now, but at the time it really wasn't for whatever reason. And so we played with a lot of different configurations but as soon as I had our office figured out and it's gone through many iterations since then, but, and we had our desks and command, that's when I sent those letters off. And that was that moment of like, oh my gosh, I had been facing a wall, trying to make things happen. Nothing was happening. I turned literally faced my life and all of these opportunities opened up. Amazing. Now I'm looking at my space right here. I'm like, I need, I need to make some changes here. <laughs> So tell us, could you give us a little bit of an introduction to the Bakwa and how you utilize that in your home, your office, your desk? Um, I think it's it's fascinating. Yeah. So the feng shui map, also known as the Bagua, is what I like to think of as an energetic blueprint. Basically, you have all of these energy portals or life areas that are represented in your house. And it looks like a tic-tac-toe board. And it's something that you line up with your front door and you just impose your house. And you don't let walls or rooms or anything get in the way. It's just divided up into these almost like, you know, nine squares um, of all equal size. And, you know, you have these different, like I said, energy assignments to different parts of your home. And so, that's one way of reading a house and sort of grabbing intel is what I really like to think of feng shui as. It's this opportunity to get really curious about the correlations between what's happening in your life and what's happening in your home. And it's it's always so startling and fascinating to people once they start making those connections. So the Bagua is that energetic blueprint that all schools of feng shui acknowledge just the way they work with those life areas varies, right? So in BTB Feng Shui, we work with the Bagua, this, this tic-tac-toe board, but in say Compass and some other schools, they will work with the life areas based on the direction that they're facing. So just for that clarification for anyone who's sort of dabbled in Feng Shui. But another thing that's also really interesting is we consider the energetics of every room, right? So your office means something, your kitchen means something, your bedroom means something, the garage means something. And it gets super, you know, um, you know, you, you feel super motivated once you start learning all these layered meanings because you suddenly notice I have all of this opportunity to co-create change with my house. I know it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. And like when people feel stuck in their lives and all of a sudden they recognize that, oh, and this, this actually is the biggest thing. One of the biggest things I want people to take from feng shui is like, you know, it feels like a nice to have, like, oh, wouldn't that be great if I could feng shui my house? Feng shui is already happening all around you. If you have space and you have stuff, the conversation is already happening, right? So what I think that people don't realize is, you know, you spend so much time trying to say, work out or buy the right foods or journal and get your mind in the right intentional space or, you know, focus on gratitude and all of these things, but they're practices you step in and out of. You mm -hmm. step into your house and you are under its influence the entire time. So really getting curious about what's happening is always to your benefit because the things that are not working in your favor will wear you down more quickly than you realize. Mm -hmm. And what makes me sad for people or feel frustrated for people is that a lot of times they work harder on themselves, thinking that the deficit has something to do with them, when in fact it could just be something in your house that's not cooperating with you. So let's talk about ways for things in your home to cooperate with you. Um, yeah. give, could you give us some examples? Yeah, I mean, I can start out with really simple ones. You know, everyone hates to hear a conversation about clutter, but that is something that, you know, we like to take into consideration. Um, and, and, you know, again, thinking of um, the perspective of you have these energetic readings of your home right? You can look at it from a Bagua perspective. You can look at it from what the life areas represent. And so let's say someone has 
a wealth area, you know, the wealth area in their house also happens to be their bedroom and there's a ton of clutter in there, then to me, you know, wealth speaks to that energy of accumulation. It speaks to the energy of self-worth. And if that's also happening in the bedroom, then that means that there are a lot of things that are getting into in your way, keeping you from attracting, you know, the right opportunities or being able to hold on to the beliefs you want to have about yourself or the ability to feel abundant, right? It's taking up space from those ideas and opportunities to actually show up. So like, that's a way that you need to be sitting there journaling and doing all the classes and the courses and reading the books and, you know, putting yourself out there. But sometimes your house is just disruptive, right? So clearing that space. And when someone hears, oh, my bedroom means this, my wealth area means this, they push up their sleeves and the clutter's gone, right? So it's almost mm -hmm. like this momentum just like downloads. <laughs> and all of a no. sudden, you know, things are, things are spiffed up. That's, you know, that's one thing. Um, another thing that I think people overlook a lot is the power of the front door, right? And, you know, I will talk a lot on Instagram and in classes and that about the power of the front door. It's, it's one of the spaces in a home that's considered to have the strongest energy. And people are like, well, we don't use our front door. We go in through another door. And I'm like, exactly. You have all of this energy that's accumulating and you're not walking it in. You're not inviting it in. And so really paying attention to what's happening outside the front door and right inside the front door, because this is where you welcome everything you want into your life. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not giving it any sort of attention, you're not using it intentionally, then that is having to say on whatever energy enters your life, right? So let's think of, this is gonna be a big jump for some, but you know, when you walk in your front door, your wealth area is in the far back left-hand corner of your house, okay? And everyone's always curious about wealth. And just for anyone else, like love is in the far back right-hand corner, okay? So when people overlook where energy enters and the quality of care that's happening at the front of the house, what I want people to hear is like, that is what gets its first fingerprints on the energy that's then going to be circulating in all those areas. So let's say you've put all this attention into your wealth area, but you did nothing to care for how energy is entering. Then some of that potency, some of that robust mm -hmm. chi that wants to show up for you is already siphoned before it's even, you know, made its way all the way in the house. So the front door is another place where, you know, you mentioned it sweeping, wiping yeah. down the door putting proofs of life outside, whether that's color or sound or, you know, like anything that suggests life, um, those things make your space very inviting. And it really does something to the quality of possibilities and opportunities coming into your life. You know, I took that um, to heart last time we spoke, which has been several years ago. And my front door is filled with these beautiful pots that are, I make sure that they are blooming or there's a lot of activity in those pots year round. I'm very, I'm very um, um, intent on making that the be a beautiful space. And then one of the things that you've mentioned in the past is putting a red envelope yeah. underneath the mat. Talk to us about that. Yeah. So feng shui there are a couple things um that we a, a couple i will say symbols that we work with one is the color red right it's the most yang color so it really is a color of intention it, it you know when we employ red with anything we're thinking blood life force it really enlivens whatever it is that you're pairing it with and so a red envelope um, you know, it has a lot of different meanings, but in this situation, I will have people put coins in the red envelope, and then I'll have them slide those coins underneath their front door mat. And it doesn't matter what coins you get. You can use coins that you have in a jar in your house. You can go and find the lucky itching coins, you know, the feng shui coins online, but you're going to put those under your mat. And then again, you want to use your front door. So every time you walk in, door you are literally walking money into your life <laughs> okay how much money are you going to put underneath your front door <laughs> i'm going to go do that right after this um so one of the things that we 
wanted to talk about today is how to bring more abundance into your life. Um, and there are so many different ways that you talk about, you know, both in your Instagram, in your book, um, just even having fresh flowers. So let's talk about all of the ways that we can bring abundance into our lives as women. And, you know, that's one of the things here on Revel 11 that we want for all women is to have a financial abundance so that they can take care of themselves. And if feng shui can help us, um, all the more power to us to have bring this abundance in every day. So one is the red envelope under the door, yeah. fresh flowers. Yeah. And let me say this about fresh flowers, because I know a lot of, well, because I, this is what I do every day, right? I talk to people and I hear the resistance, like there's not a special occasion. Who are they for? Where are they going to go? They don't last long enough, right? Everyone has the excuses. And what I want everyone to consider doesn't mean you have to change your mind, but everyone wants wealth, but mm -hmm. they're not comfortable bringing wealth into their home. Right there, there's the interruption to abundance, right? Because that's what flowers represent. Like if you're like, what's the special occasion? You're bringing in the opportunity for special occasions to find you. They're too expensive. They don't last long enough. Oh, you mean you're indulging? You're saying I deserve this, right? And so a lot of people fancy themselves being able to have wealth just land on the doorstep and being able to handle it. And the truth is we need to be comfortable with it. We need to build up the stamina. We need to already be keeping company with it. And so to me, fresh flowers feel like a really small way to ritualize that. And I will tell everyone, you know, you were asking what I did in the beginning, fresh flowers, truthfully, I did not have the money. It felt indulgent, but they were the only thing that I could hold myself honestly to because they had them at the grocery store. So I was like, I'm going to be at the grocery store. So I'm not going to be able to make excuses. And I just bought whatever was cheapest. And then I started getting really clever with like, okay, what day do your fresh deliveries come in? Because then I would show up on those days to make sure that they were going to last longer. What flowers last the longest? And I started learning ways to manage my wealth, right? So like, there's so much metaphor there. And now I don't have, there's usually not a time unless we've traveled that we don't have fresh flowers here, but that wasn't where I started. That was the intention. So I just think fresh flowers are a really great way for people to confront ways that they might be getting in their way. Um, other place that I love for people to focus on when it comes to wealth is their bedroom. So something that I've noticed over, again, just years of consultations is, you know, bedrooms are usually an afterthought. Bedrooms are sometimes the space that people are like, do we need to go in my bedroom? Uh, yeah, we absolutely do <laughs> because I'm going to know how you see yourself. I'm going to know how you prioritize you. And if the bedroom is where everything that you don't want people to see goes, then it tells me that you prioritize other people over yourself. And I, there's no judgment. I just want people to make the connection between if you don't prioritize yourself you can't expect the friend group, the boss, the opportunity to fall out of thin air to prioritize you. You have to make that suggestion in your space first. In fact, when people are buying a home and they're like, okay, what should I do first? I'm like, set your bedroom up first because it programs the home. It sets a very signature quality that you matter, that you're a priority. Okay. The other thing that I like for people to think about when it comes to the bedroom is the closer you are to something, the stronger its influence. So, you know, your bed is where you spend a third of your life. And so, you know, there are two ways to look at this one, what are you keeping company with? And is it really in support of your sleep, sensuality, stillness? And two, you know, where can you indulge? Where can you really ramp up the luxury, if you will? Because again, you are, you are under the influence of the energy you're around. You're even more vulnerable in your bedroom because this is where you sleep, right? So where can you make mindful edits? And then where can you make mindful upgrades that are going to support your energy? Because your, you know, your sense of self-worth is so tied to your wealth. So can and, you give us an example of a mindful upgrade? 
So, okay. Yeah. So if you are the person who say by the bedside and I'm guilty of all this too. So I, you know, I live in conversation with my space just as much as the next person. But if you have all the self-help books by the bed, you have all of the essential oils, you have the lotions, you have the, you know, all the things that say, I'm going to take better care of myself, but you never really do them. It's not the promise Who's of doing it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we all are. We all are. We all are. <laughs> Fear is a very powerful marketing tool, right? So after time, if you start noticing that you are frustrated with yourself, that you are beating yourself up more, that you're saying, I don't have the time, I'm not making the time, those kind of things, just look to your bedside table. Oh my gosh. I, I'm going to go make some changes immediately following this call. I'm going to have a very busy day after this <laughs> webinar is over. <laughs> so. well, I'm happy to motivate. I'm happy to motivate. Thank but here's you. the thing, like then that, that creates some kind of momentum, right? Because now you're sleeping more soundly. You don't have the chatter of all the should have, would have, could have's. And you wake up more refreshed and that's the energy that you go out into the day with. But more importantly, and what I want people to hear, feng shui is not transactional. This is a compounding effect. And so you just get more and more refreshed, right? Because you, you're you eliminating a lot of that noise, mm -hmm. a lot of that distraction. Um, it's the same thing with the phone by the bed, right? That's the outside world. And it's so easy to think like, well, I need it there, but it's like, you're inviting all of that into your room at night. And so if you're someone who's waking up running through like all the things you need to do, and I need to make sure I take care of this and your to-do list decides to start populating at three in the morning, just try moving the phone. That was last night <laughs> from two to three 30 to twirling on everything I needed to do. So um, there's other opportunities for us to bring in abundance everything from you know a lot of us are working at home these days um, and so say for instance let's talk about our desk and our purse yes. and whatever else you want to add to that list yeah so offices are another place I you know so especially if you work from home but this works in any office you know home you just have a lot more wiggle room one of the things that when I'm on a consultation, you know, whether that's virtually or I'm actually in someone's house, one of the things that I like to do is where are my eyes landing first in every room? Because it tells me what's pulling the energy, right? So if I walk into an office and there are boxes or things that are needing tending or there's a filing cabinet open or whatever, that is the energy. That is the energy overall of the room. If I walk in and I see something really, you know, like bright color or beautiful flowers or whatever, then that tells me that there is some really healthy chi happening in here, right? And we can and we can modify if if needed. But what you are first drawn to, and it's hard when you're so familiar with your space, but what you're first drawn to is setting the tone. So that's something that you actually have a lot of, you know, ability to change mm -hmm. and be deliberate about, right? Like, what is it that I want to focus on? And then that is where your creative genius gets to step in because you can say, okay, I'm here to be innovative. I'm here to go big. I really want to collaborate I'm looking to make some bold moves. Okay, those, whatever word you're using, there is your descriptor. And then you get to choose the thing or things that hold space, that hold court, that hold that intention in place in your office. So that's one of the first things that mm -hmm. I like people to really dial into. And it takes a minute because you have to get creative about it, but you can look while you're watching TV, you can look in magazines, you know, when you're out and about at friends, houses or different hotels or whatever, start to notice what you're drawn to, right? So for me, going back to the fresh flowers, hotels always had the most amazing arrangements, like, and I thought that's just such a welcoming feeling. And, and that's what I like to have at the front of our house too. So what is it that you're drawn to? And see if you can like find something that aligns with what your intention in your space is. Another thing is to be mindful of, again, what's happening in your space, right? So we tend to let things sit on the floor. And I don't mean like the furniture and things that live on the floor, but like boxes or piles of things. And that can weigh your energy down. So it's not about having a pristine, immaculately organized space around the clock. 
It's about creating some sort of consistent ritual around giving the energy a chance to breathe. When we talk about money, specifically <laughs> money, you know, feng shui is this language and energy and abundance comes in through moving energy. So if you have spaces that are suffocating, that are stagnant, nothing ever changes, it's really hard to get that refreshed energy again, opportunities, possibilities, moving mm -hmm. in your space. So that's a great thing. Like get things up off the floor, allow energy to move, maybe change some things around because you know, when what you see changes, what you're actually seeing changes. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, there's a lot of metaphor there for working with your space. And then so, yeah, you ask too, to create a ritual around clearing that up at the end of the day. So one, one thing that you mentioned, it's like go in and change in one day. What is the number? If you change um, X number of things. In, things. Yeah. 27 things. Talk to us about that because I'm going to change 27 things today. <laughs> yeah. So 27 is one of those numbers that feng shui practitioners like, and it has, you know, there are a couple different ways people explain it. Um, and, and they're probably all going to be correct if you go Google school it, but you know, there's this power to the number three. Okay. And three is a number that triggers change, right? It's like, it's really bold that way. And so when you do three times three times three, you get 27, right? So you're really playing with like that three on top, like three on steroids. <laughs> so moving 27 things around, what's actually interesting about this is you start to figure out where you are holding back where you're afraid of change. Okay. So let's go back to this bag wall for a second. Let's talk about that. I like to tell people, okay, move 27 things and just go through your whole house. Like don't limit yourself to one room. You can, but the exercise is this, you might walk in a room and be like, I don't want to change anything. And if you know that area of your life, you're going to be able to make a correlation where you might be hesitant to make any changes. And again, this is just information. What you do with it is still ultimately up to you, but it's great to see through this map, through where you start to have a little resistance where that might be showing up actually in your life, right? Mm -hmm. So by moving 27 things around, what you're doing is you're creating new ways of energy moving through your life. You're changing the way that you see things. And one of my favorite suggestions, and you maybe have already heard it is, you know, when people are like, oh, it doesn't make that big of a difference, go change a couple of your kitchen drawers right now, especially the one where your silverware is. And then notice how many days or weeks it takes before you're back on autopilot, because you will continually go to the same drawer. You'd be like, oh, that's right. I moved it. That's what happens in our houses. We get so familiar with the patterns mm -hmm. that we don't even see that nothing new is happening. And when we're wanting new opportunities, when we're wanting to show up in the world in different ways, our house has to be part of that process because again, it's the container that you're in and under the influence of. Well, and that's, we, you know, our homes become so stagnant and this, mm -hmm. this enlivens the energy, which I love so much. Yes. So um, talking about abundance more, let's talk about our purses. Yes. Oh, let's. So purse yes. hygiene. I love this conversation. So I think there was a reel. Well, I know I have a reel where I, you know, set my purse down on a stool and said, you know, don't um, put your purse on the floor. It shows disregard for wealth. And I think that's what inspired this whole conversation. So when I look at purses or wallets, whatever you carry to go into the store or make purchases, it is its own little money home. And so there are just a couple different things that, again, are super simple, but often overlooked that we can do to really enhance that sense of financial flourishing. Um, so one, not setting your purse on the floor. Mm -hmm. Two, uh, being mindful about what's happening in your wallet, right? So a couple things, sometimes, you know, people open their wallets and they have a ton of receipts or, you know, um, grocery lists or, you know, just uh, coupons, paper stuff, right? All of those suggest money spent. So clearing that out is a way to refresh your wallet and not make it feel like your money, you know, is already spent, Another thing when people have really, you know, um, serious money challenges, I'll ask about credit cards if 
the conversation leans that way. And if they are at capacity, I'll suggest removing them from the wallet and putting them somewhere else. Again, this just removes that money spent energy. And it starts to create open space. Open space is a very strong metaphor in feng shui. Open space for new opportunities and ways of accumulating money to show up, okay? Mm -hmm. Another thing that I love doing is once you've cleaned your wallet, I love money magnets is what I call them. So I'll sprinkle in a little bit of salt or I'll drop a cinnamon stick into my wallet. And both, have, you know, both are symbolic of money in different ways. They have ability to draw that money energy to us. And let me be clear, money energy means opportunity, but you probably will have to engage and participate. <laughs> it doesn't mean <laughs> that money will just land in your life, right? So it involves, uh, you know, us participating, um, showing up for the assignments when they show up. But those are ways of keeping that, think of it as your money chi really refreshed. And so mm -hmm. I will, um, you know, I, I don't recommend doing both. You don't need both. A lot of times when we try to do all the things, it can suggest that we're really desperate. And now that chi is kind of in the mix. So pick one and work with it. Um, and then I just get into this ritual of doing this, you know, at least once a month, if not once a week, maybe not the salt and the cinnamon stick, you could do those at the beginning of the month or on a new moon or something like that. But clearing out the paper clutter, making sure that your the money that you have is lined up, that you're taking care of it, it's not shoved in there, like all the ways that you can show respect to your money. It's this idea of what you appreciate, appreciate. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, you know, even the financial planners say, it's a, you know, respect your money and it will respect you back. And, and that's really true. It's like, how can we be thoughtful? And what you're talking about is being mindful about everything, you know, the way we live, what, where we place things and, you know, it's easy. It's so easy. Life gets so busy and we come in it's like, oh my gosh, I just, you know, I need to start my evening and I need to cook. And then you, you throw down your purse on the, on the floor. What are some tools that you use on a daily basis that help you in your life, Amanda? So I have a couple and, you know, truthfully, this is one of the things I get asked a lot, you know, cause I think people think I have some magical template. It really changes depending on the weather that we're in. Right. So a few of the things I do, I do, um, I talk about waking your house up and putting your house to bed at night. So one of the things that I do is I get up, I turn on lights, um, I open blinds so that when the sun comes up, it can come in. A lot of times I used to do like a Palo Santo or incense, like I would just kind of clear the energy. I don't even really have a ton of time for that now. So I have like different spritzes that I've bought and I just go through and I kind of just set an intention for the day. It's nothing drawn out. It is really mm -hmm. simple. Um, when I go to start my coffee, I'm a coffee gal. Um, and that water is moving, moving water, you know, is very symbolic of, um, you know, fortune and, and flowing fortune. So that's another opportunity for me to set an intention and just think about wealth and when I say wealth, um, I, I want to be clear here because a lot of people, we hear wealth and we hear mm -hmm. and we think money, investments, lottery, um, you know, savings, those kind of things. But I like for people to consider fortunate as part of that, mm -hmm. you know, um, body. So what is it that makes you feel fortunate? And that's really what I mean when I, when I discuss wealth, of course it's money, but sometimes it's having the accumulation of knowledge. Sometimes it's the abundance of, you know, um, resource. Sometimes, you know, you start thinking about really all the things that line up to create wealth. And so when we talk about being fortunate and for everyone, it actually gets pretty different when you get into a more intimate conversation, it becomes a very nuanced um, list, but that's when I say fortune or, you know, setting intention wealth, those are the things like, what is it that would really help me maintain the momentum or what's going to help me gain some motivation to start creating the momentum. So those are ways to think of it. Um, other things that I do, you know, when we sit down for a meal, um, you know, I, I set the table and I know this sounds like a lot and some people are really busy. I'm just at a different stage in my life and my girls are home for a minute again. Um, I take the time to set the table because that's an act in abundance, right? The ability to feed awesome. others, the ability to gather around those details mm -hmm. 
as small as they may seem, I'm looking for the adding up. I'm looking for the compounding. And it's just a gesture that allows our energy, right, to accumulate in the space too. So something I haven't said, you know, your house is one part of the equation. You're the other. And so <laughs> yeah, you've got to show up. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so your chi matters too. So yes. like, this is why it's so fantastic to take care of your house, because if you can come home mm -hmm. and be like, oh, this feels good. Even after a really lousy day, yeah. your energy is not going to hit rock bottom. What's yeah. harder is when you wait till your energies hit rock bottom and you're like, okay, now I need to feng shui. And it's going to feel more frustrating. It's not that it's impossible, mm -hmm. but do you know what I'm saying? You haven't yeah. built the infrastructure yet. And so all of those little things that you can do to make sure that your chi is flourishing too helps the house as well. Right. So it's like I say, it's this conversation. Um, other things I love sweeping the front porch. It sounds like such, again, an easy thing, but the ritual here is out with the old and with the new. And again, when we go back to that idea of how are you welcoming energy in your life? Mm -hmm. Are you creating the sense of invitation and intrigue and setting the tone here of what you expect. It's a really simple thing overall to do. Um, yeah, those are some little things. I mean, yeah. you know, like my bird feeders that filled with bird seed, those kind of things, you know, there's just lots of little things that I like to say. Yeah, never let things get too low, right? Like even, you know, I was reading something you said, it's like, even if there's a candle that's like all the way to, to the bottom, throw it away and create more abundance. Yeah. So it's the idea, like, again, everything is having a conversation with you. So one of the things people could do is walk through. And if you are really honest with yourself and you stay away from revisioning any of those first impressions, you can start to get a sense of what your things are saying. So like, let's use that as an example. Um, you know, if someone has like, let's say a lot of jars in the refrigerator or a lot of leftovers and there's like this much left, right? Of course, it makes common sense to hold on to stuff that you know you're going to use. But if you notice that this is a pattern and, you know, you're, you're holding on to, if there's that correlation in your life where you're like, I'm holding on to because I've got to wait for the right opportunity or I don't know where the abundance is going to come in next then you can see how that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. And so it's really being mindful of what are the things around you saying. And a lot of times, you know, abundance begins with the consciousness of it. Wealth yeah. begins with the ability that we have already an accumulation to pull from. Oh, I and just love this so much. Things. Yeah. But and so, so in Amanda's book, so today, April 9th, today, as a quickie reminder, um, of easy offenders to bounce from the shelf of your next pantry purge. I mean, to the point of when, when there's things that are low, outdated, candy from past, expired cans, like all of these things that are so easy to overlook are really important to, to freshen up, to toss. It's okay to toss things and to bring in new more, new, more energy. I mean, like aprons, cookie cutters, do you use them? Um, Anyway, it says a kitchen radically nourishes and replenishes you um, to the bones when it's cleared of congestion. So lean into the power and clean and get rid of anything you're, um, that's not worth missing. That's yeah. just one tip for today. <laughs> yeah. And let me say this, because I know sometimes people feel, you know, that it's wasteful. And my intention is not that that becomes a pattern. I actually think that the yearly clear the clutter is, you know, it, it leans into that sort of wastefulness. My hope is that people, again, I use the word intentional. I use the word deliberate a lot because it's like, if you know that these are things that you're not using, that they're not serving a purpose, then beware for the next mm -hmm. impulse, right? Yeah. Like so that you don't yeah. bring them back in. That's, I think, part of the beauty of feng shui is when you start to understand the energy on tap in your space, when you start to understand what the different areas of your home mean, then you can be a better filter for what gets to take up real estate in that area of your house because it's speaking to a part of your life. When we don't know those things, it's really easy to just fill because a lot of times we fill things just to feel something. When you start understanding what everything means, you have you know better impulse control. 
Absolutely. So let's get to some questions in the chat. So um, Christy says, you mentioned the financial sector is in the far back left. That would be my balcony as I live in an apartment. What can we do to support these areas? So a couple things, let me say. So yes, you can, um, for your balcony, having plants out there, anything that feels lush. So when you think well, what is the first thing you think? And because it's a balcony, I would say, think of somewhere you've traveled, somewhere you've gone, a nice patio you've sat on. What are the features or the details that made it feel like had that, you know, ambiance or like, you know, something that you're like, oh my gosh, I just love this here. That's something usually pretty easy to replicate out on a, out on a balcony. So I would say that. The other thing I want to have people um, take away from this, though, is that that bag wah is really versatile. So you can apply it to your house, but you can also take it and apply it to any room. So standing at the door of any room, the far back left hand corner, if you're standing at the door looking in, the far back left hand corner of any room will be a wealth area. So you have wealth areas throughout your house. You can also do that on your desk. Sitting at your desk, like I'm sitting facing my desk right now, that back left-hand corner would be a wealth area for me. I keep roses on mine. Um, like you can play up the bagua in all different ways throughout your house. And so you're not really limited to just the reading of your home property, which I think is really encouraging for people. Yeah, yeah I do too. So Kat asks, should we carry money in our wallet even though we don't use it on a daily basis? Yes, absolutely. Again, the consciousness of abundance. It goes back to that, like wealth begins with the consciousness of abundance. If you know that you have money in your wallet, you know there's abundance there. You don't ever have to think, oh, I need to go get money or whatever, right? It's like just crossing it off the list. I got it there. Whether I carry it or not, it's there. Okay, this is such a good one. So Ruth from our team, um, she says, my far back um, left is the master bath. That can't be good, right? Yeah, I know. There's so much information out there that makes people think that having bathrooms in certain areas of your house is bad. So I like to say, okay, remember, this is modern day feng shui. We like bathrooms. We don't have to use an outhouse. <laughs> so everyone like- We're so lucky, right? <laughs> we love our bathrooms. And actually what I think is fantastic about, um, you know, a bathroom in the wealth area is the element. So there's so much information that is, you know, comes with the bag gua. And in feng shui, we work with the five elements and every gua has an element that we'll say is most at home. And the element that's most at home and wealth is wood. Okay, now we're gonna go a little bit more advanced here. Wood is the element that helps manage water. So in a bathroom where you have all this energy, this water that's going down the drain and people hear that and they're like, oh my gosh, my wealth is going down the drain. You offset that by having wood. Now, another big conversation, wood is not just plants, although plants tend to do pretty well in bathrooms, but it's a lot of different things. Wood is expressed in a lot of different ways. So it can be the color green, it can be vertical stripes, it can be woven baskets, it can be a runner. Like there's so many different ways that you can work in that energy of wood. And so you just offset it like really being mindful of the way you detail the room and it creates that balance and it holds on to that sort of draining energy that people tend to hyperventilate about when they hear, oh no, my wealth is going down the drain. <laughs> <laughs> and um, let's talk about the kitchen too, really quick. Um, someone asked about that and mine is actually the kitchen as well. So a couple of tips for the kitchen and in, in the wealth area. So when it comes to the kitchen, what I'll say is the kitchen is the seat of health and wealth. That's, you know, sort of a way that we look at it. So it doesn't matter where your kitchen is, the supplies, so don't feel like you just have to have a kitchen and wealth. But the first thing, actually use your kitchen, right? Like a lot of people have this misconception that, you know, feng shui has to be expensive and you have to have all the best things and labels and that. I have been in some of the most beautiful homes that have, you know, not great chi because no one is actually use, using the spaces. And so there's that, remember, I, it's this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. If it's one-sided, eventually the conversation stops and nothing's happening, right? So using your kitchen is one of the best things. Um, one of my favorite things to do in the kitchen, okay, this will be fun for everyone, is, um, and this actually ties to wealth. So I love to make sure that the stove gets used, okay? So I'm gonna give you two things. One, um, 
you know, make sure you're turning on all your burners at least once a day. Okay. So that burners represent I definitely need to do that. Yeah. They speak to resources. And so it's like, you're stoking your opportunity for resources to come into your life. You only have to leave the burners on for a couple seconds. Um, but that's just something really great to do. And you can set it so that you do it for nine days or 27 days, and then notice if anything has changed, what's shown up. Cause it's, you know, I want you to have the validation of the experience, but I love working with like brewing some sense. Okay. So a couple things happening here. One, you're using your oven Two, you put water in a pot on the stove. I should say the stove, you're using your stove, putting the water on top of the stove and it's moving and moving water is moving money. Like that is financial flow, mm -hmm. right? Three, you can actually change the energy of your home through scent. So you can add in a couple different things and give your space a cleanse without having to wave around a smoke wand or doing incense or whatever. So I love working Isn't. with, yeah. So for this, I would tell people, use the Williams Sonoma. I love Williams Sonoma, their smell for the spring because you're working with lemons, you're working with um, rosemary and you're working with vanilla, okay? And it's like, I mean, eyeball it, but like a couple lemon sliced, a couple sprigs of rosemary, a tablespoon of vanilla. Okay. Awesome. But all of those things actually mean something too. So the lemons are really great when we need to make big decisions. They're great for helping us to forgive ourselves. Rosemary speaks to women's financial freedom, right? And it also is really great for having clarity around money. And then vanilla is one of the higher vibrations that really speaks to like that sweetness, that likability. And so when you bring all of that together, you're getting all of those properties brewing and, you know, kind of simmering throughout your house. Bring on the rosemary. <laughs> so, um, so Amanda, tell us about your upcoming class. It starts on, I think the 23rd, right? Yes, it does. So I have this course online that is a self-study, self-paced, you know, you, you, enroll and everything just drips out to you. But I'm coming back to the classroom on April 23rd and I'm teaching all of those modules live. So once a week we're meeting and I'm teaching those live, you know, as the pre-recorded modules, they're about an hour, right? Because it's a self-study and, and, you know, there's not the back and forth, but when we go live, these become like mini master classes on each of the main concepts that I work with when I go in to consult. So you learn so much being That's in class amazing. with me. And then also from the conversation and questions that happen, it's it's one of the best learning experiences out there when it comes to feng shui. Well, I have to say, I mean, just today, Amanda, it's been so um, educational about all of the things that we can do to work with our home and our own energy to bring abundance in every day. And I'd love for people to continue to share, you know, on Instagram about their experiences when they start moving things around. So oh, make sure you go. Me, tag me. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be doing a post today and then you can add in there. Um, also just a couple of quick questions, just as you know, um, that I would love for you to say, what would you tell your younger self today? Um, I invest in yourself. Uh, you know, I held out a lot, white knuckled and held out a lot. And every time I invest in myself, big bump. Yeah. Okay. What is the best piece of advice you ever received? This too shall pass. <laughs> you know what? That's mine too. It, you know, it will. And, and everything will all work out. And how do you stay grounded in this crazy world that we're living in right now? Um, I, you know, I'm really fortunate that I have a really cool family. You know, my girls are amazing and the ability to just walk away and, and spend time with them. Um, I also go for walks every day. You know, those are my walks with spirit and it's just like, you know, it, it's letting everything go. It's just, you know, discharging, if you will. Um, I, those, those two things I would say are what I would not want to have to go without. Yeah. And then, um, you know, with the eclipse yesterday, you and I were talking a little bit about this before um, everyone joined. And, you know, I, I think for, you know, an ending thought, what was your thought on um, the eclipse? It, it To me, it was just about how we're all on this little planet in the middle of the universe. And is did you have any takeaway from that? 
Yeah, I mean, I had to. I, I was telling you that I'm in Dallas and everyone descended here. And I was sort of like, what in the world is happening? Like it is capital C crazy. <laughs> Um, but there was also this moment, I do think that that's, you know, that we're part of something so much bigger, you know, and yes. everyone has different labels for that. But there was that moment I was telling you where I was like, okay, the cloud, you know, the clouds are just getting heavier or whatever. And then it went to total blackout and you could hear the animals and then it was light again. And it really was this moment of like, wow, we all just shared that. And I just, I, I do, let me say this. I actually love that you asked that question because when it comes to feng shui, I don't find it as, as something frivolous. I don't think of it as design focused or specific. I think of it as a way of planting love in your space. I find it a way of valuing who you are. Mm -hmm. And I think that if more people can have those kind of ecosystems, regardless of what's happening in those four walls, like finding ways to tuck that in, we show up ready to be part of that connectedness differently because there is so much divisiveness. So I really do think feng shui has that ability to ripple in really powerful, amazing ways. And, and that's what I felt yesterday was, it was like, wow, we all just, I mean, all my neighbors were out and I was just like, yeah. we all just shared that moment. That's just so, you know, it's, it's amazing. Amanda, that was the most beautiful way to end our conversation today. Thank you so much for joining. I've got so many takeaways and I know everyone else does too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And let's do this again. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate it. Okay. Um, and everyone check out Amanda's website. We put it in the chat and sign up for that class. Wow. What an amazing opportunity to work with her. Thank you so much. I'm so inspired. Okay. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Take care.